the past few days, if not weeks, have revealed how some groups of people have been outed for predatory behavior and even outright delusions of grandeur and in the process allowed people critical of such individuals and entities to weaponize skepticism and even reason to argue their point and assert that they are right and everyone else is wrong. However, even if we discern which of the things we observe is black and white, the truth is a nuance that can be found in between, in the gray area, so to speak, and not a definite shade as cynics present. So on this episode of the Intrepid Podcast, we talk about how some certain groups that have been labeled as cults have their members, both loyal and disavowed, generalized as menaces to society in general unless they personally condemn it in the most extreme terms. We also talk about why the skepticism and cynicism that follows unfortunately distorts reason and civil discourse. Basically, we're going to talk about three things, maybe four if time permits. We have Apollo Kiboloy and his arrest, Emily Armstrong and her uh uh issues uh of because he uh, she joined Lincoln Park and the new study about the shroud of Turin maybe the fourth would be uh Pope Francis's controversial take on his speech in Singapore either way with that said the intrepid podcast starts now <laughs> I am Ian Rinyon, an independent alternative media practitioner, among other things, and welcome to another episode of the Intrepid Podcast. Now, the week of the 8th to the 14th of September 2024 began with the unusual and uncanny arrest of Apollo Kiboloy, a pastor who leads the cult called the Kingdom of Jesus Christ in the southern Philippine city of Davao. It could be said that the apprehension was unusual and uncanny because the cult's followers have been claiming that he personally surrendered after a fortnight of staying inside an alleged bunker beneath the KOJC compound, which was conveniently located beside the Davao International Airport. So make of it what you will. While everyone else claimed that he was arrested since a warrant has been issued prior to the police storming into the compound. And when I said fortnight, a few sentences or a few words ago, I mean two weeks, not fortnight the game, for uh, the information of Gen Zers and Generation Alpha out there who are listening to this uh, somehow irrelevant millennial. His arrest came just days after controversial personality, uh, another controversial personality, uh, which is the Chinese spy and former mayor Alice Kuo, was arrested alongside her associates in Indonesia, a topic which is in itself another can of worms. Now, in a very irrelevant tangent, I would like to apologize to the Mormons for mixing the official name of their church with that of Kiboloi's cult uh, as I as I think about it in my mind and come up with uh, this this, uh, name called or this entity called the Kingdom of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Again, it just comes out of my mouth with a bad taste and I certainly do not want to make fun of it because it is a serious matter uh, despite the circumstances about Kiboloy's arrest and the events leading up to it being low-key hilarious. Anyway, again... Uh, to the Mormons out there, I'm very sorry for this kind of thought that I have in my head. I really don't want to uh, share it to you, but uh, for transparency reasons, I have to. Anyway, it could be said that the crusade against cults that have been alleged to commit criminal activities as well as cult-like behaviors like what's going on in the Mr. Beast drama saga has been consistent over the past few years 
and even decades. Some of them have been shut down after authorities got themselves involved, while others continue to operate and even flourish, but has been ostracized and labeled by the court of public opinion as groups that have very unorthodox and outright heretical beliefs from established religious doctrines, crazy people with plenty of time on their hands who quietly make their presence known through their symbols and speech, and quite often, organizations led by a nefarious cabal of ministers and other people who themselves may have records of intimidation against critics, predatory behavior, or even outright criminal activity. Now, in the case of the KOJC, the cult label fits to a T, as in terrible. Uh, The same goes with other minor cults like the World Olivet Assembly, which is practically a tamer offshoot of the Unification Church in Korea, a.k.a. the Moonies or the Cult of Moon Sun Myung, and the Church of Scientology, among others. And in speaking of the Church of Scientology, this leads us to the issue of Linkin Park's new co-vocalist, Emily Armstrong, and her connections with the True Blue American cult. It is understood that Armstrong, formerly the co-founder and vocalist of the rock band Dead Sarah, was born and raised into the Church of Scientology and was alleged to have personally supported disgraced Hollywood actor, convicted sex offender, and fellow Scientologist Danny Masterson. However, it is not known how much support she offered Masterson before he was sentenced to prison for sexual abuse. What was clear on the other hand was that she addressed the matter within hours, perhaps a day, but within hours, after her first performance with Linkin Park. Either way, it, uh, this first performance the band uh, did after seven years was live-streamed on their YouTube channel and on their website on the 5th of September, 2024. Now, Uh, Emily Armstrong's statement goes like this, and I quote, Several years ago, I was asked to support someone I considered a friend at a court appearance and went to one early hearing as an observer. Soon after, I realized I shouldn't have. I always try to see the good in people and I misjudged him. I have never spoken with him since. Unimaginable details emerged after he was later found guilty. To say it as clearly as possible, I do not condone abuse or violence against women and I empathize with the victims of these crimes. That's the end of the quote. Still, anti-cult crusaders and some of the band's fans, most of which are still reeling from the tragic demise of Chester Bennington seven years ago, I have to emphasize that, Chester Bennington is no longer with us for seven years and and, underst- and understandably so that these people are still reeling from it, assert that this statement from Armstrong was either weak, insufficient, or insincere and stressed that Armstrong cannot and will not replace Bennington when in fact it was never the band's explicit intention. Her addition into the band was also a point of division within the Bennington family as Chester's son, Jamie, called out Linkin Park's leader and co-vocalist Mike Shinoda of disgracing and quote-unquote erasing his father's legacy. This is despite the fact that Chester's widow, widow, Talinda, showed her support for what was perceived as the new chapter of the band where its intention was to move forward by outrightly keeping the legacy of Bennington alive while creating new material that somehow promotes the spirit of the band with Chester in it. Or uh, with Chester as a, let's just say, uh, a recurring theme or, uh, you know, uh, a driving force for that band. And... As for the Bennington family, let's be uh, clear here. Talinda is actually uh, the second wife of Chester Bennington. And perhaps Jamie 
uh, his son is uh, uh, the product of uh, of him and uh, of Chester and his first wife. So uh, I understand that this is somehow uh, confusing. As not really a Lincoln Park fan, maybe maybe not, but I do appreciate all of their material, no matter how it sounds. Now, uh, going back to uh, the topic, Shinoda himself said uh, in their comeback live stream that the audience will now play the uh, quote unquote the role of Chester Bennington moving forward, which could be considered proof that the that, that the band intends to keep the late singer's spirit alive in every in every show, as I mentioned earlier. It could also be noticed that Armstrong was visibly emotional in several parts of the live stream, which was her debut performance with the band, which some fans perceived not only as a result to, uh, uh, of, to, fa- to paraphrase, uh, Link- the Linkin Park hit, hit Numb, feeling the pressure of walking in Chester's shoes, but also because she herself was a fan of the band and the impact of her addition to it appears to be personal. During the band's Apple Music interview by New Zealander entertainment presenter Zane Lowe, Armstrong revealed that she was heavily inspired to launch herself into the world of music by Linkin Park's first official album, Hybrid Theory, thus proving that she has been a fan of the band prior to being tapped on board. Of particular note uh, in one of the in one of Hybrid Theory's songs, One Step Closer, uh, I think uh, Emily said, or Armstrong said, that she was absolute, uh, she absolutely wanted to cover One Step Closer and, you know, um, scream from the top of, the, my, uh, of her lungs uh, that part in the song where uh, Chester once sung Shut Up When I'm Talking to You. And during... The live stream, in my opinion, she nailed it. Changed my mind. Chester was proud of her during that uh, during that performance. Anyway, on the other hand, other fans of Linkin Park and those of Dead Sarah pointed out that her statement was a reflection of her delicate situation within the Scientology cult, or at least her unfortunate affiliation to it specifying that while she may have wanted to come out as a critic, it would result in much worse outcomes than the current state of affairs that is playing out, including but not limited to character and even literal assassination. Now, these fans additionally speculated that Armstrong had instead made cryptic messages against the cult on some of her dead Sarah songs as well as Linkin Park's new single called The Emptiness Machine, and revealed that she was probably a lesbian, one of several sexual and gender gender identities Scientology labels as against its doctrine. Due to the powerful influence of the Church of Scientology, such speculations may not be proven in the future, if at all, and such an influence can be similarly observed in a substantially large group here uh, here in the Philippines, which is frankly much larger than Kiboloy's, but it's another can of worms altogether. In the end, you might ask, does it even matter? I say, in the end, what matters most is for all of us, uh, for all of us rather, is introspection. And with that said, this has been the common observation. Cults knowingly or unknowingly trigger skepticism from everyone outside their circles and unfortunately, an unhealthy dose of skepticism clouds reason by promoting science and empiricism as the purest and only acceptable forms of critical thinking in all things and in all discussions. As a result, people end up promoting hopelessness through cynicism. 
A practical and unfortunate side effect of such cynical reasoning is the xenophobia people increasingly present against all religious beliefs, specifically Christianity, which could be considered a sweeping generalization due to the bad apples affecting the reputation of such congregations. For example, a new study about the Shroud of Turin, the alleged cloth that was wrapped around the body of Jesus Christ after he was taken down from the cross, revealed that most of the cloth itself was at least 2,000 years old and more importantly, that the stains that marked it were consistent with Jesus' torture and crucifixion as told, as told rather, in all four canonical Gospels in the Bible. And yet, even when faced with rather compelling evidence proving what seemed to be literal Bible truths, the craving or demand for more evidence for, from the most stubborn of anti-religious folks, preferably those favoring their atheistic or anti-religious bias, is absolutely insatiable and, frankly, cynical. This was the sentiment also observed by the editors of the National Catholic Register, an American Catholic newspaper currently owned by uh, the famous, not really famous, but the uh, world-renowned uh, Catholic network EWTN. Now, while the Catholic Church is the, uh, the largest Christian denomination in the world, has not explicitly declared that the Shroud of Turin is indeed the cloth that first witnessed that what Christians believe as the resurrection of Christ. The editorial uh, uh, stressed that the church, guided by the watchword Fides Quaerens Intellectum, faith-seeking understanding, has spearheaded scientific efforts to discover the truth behind the artifact and promoted further studies to understand it. The editors wrote, and I quote, It should be pointed out that the people who most passionately insist the shroud is a fraud, no matter what evidence to the contrary, contrary comes forward, are completely unscientific themselves. They operate from, a, from the premise that science has already proved the non-existence of God and that, therefore, all supernatural claims about the burial cloth must be bunk. Yet, in reality, the physical sciences don't address the existence of God at all. They investigate the mechanics of our created universe, not the mechanism by which it was created in the first place. Now, a healthy dose of skepticism is understandably required to be a good scientist, a good philosopher, and, or a good empiricist in general. However, questioning everything without seeing what is good, beautiful, and true in it, especially if it is for others not, and not for the self, leads to a cynical mindset. And that is what is dangerous in the world we currently live in, as it, is, as it usually leads to people losing hope for the world and for each other. Now, one of the phrases or sentences that could summarize this is uh, the frequently asked question, what is in it for me? You know, that's the question. And before we go on, uh, I haven't uh, added this or uh, this thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, not added on the Substack article and in the script for uh, this episode of the Intrepid Podcast. But uh, we all know that Pope Francis uh, is basically wrapping up his, or have already ra- has already wrapped up his uh, Asia-Pacific tour of four nations, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, and, um, and Singapore. Singapore is the final leg of the Pope's uh, tour, and for some reason, uh, he made another statement that really uh, pissed off a lot of Catholics, even though it's not ex cathedra. And that phrase goes, uh, all paths lead to God. I think that's the quote. And 
you know, some Catholics who have been cynical of Francis, obviously, uh, you know, uh, were, uh, uh, you know, uh, were up in arms carrying pitchforks uh, and, uh, and, and are saying, extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. And I understand where these people are coming from. And quite frankly, I myself have a problem with what uh, the Pope said. Given that um, Singapore is basically um, a country that wanted to uh, uh, promote our harmony between its three uh three major ethnic communities the chinese the malay and the uh, and the tamil uh or indian whatever and but even so he would have worded it properly again this is a case of uh improper wording from the pope and the vatican somehow trying to spin it off as hey that's not what he meant Again, I would let the Vaticanistas and the Catholic journalists or the legit Catholic journalists duke it out and explain what the hell is going on. But you know what? I really just wanted to share this tangent because it does relate to cynicism, uh, especially in the Catholic Church. Because quite understandably, a lot of Catholics have become cynical towards the Pope that uh you know uh they would just not care uh or if they do they would just um create memes and all that stuff so i just wanted to relate that anyway uh your um your opinions or your uh, thoughts regarding the pope's uh uh, uh <laughs> new installation of uh the things things that he said that were problematic you can uh, comment down below uh, or in the or in the Spotify or Substack show notes or in the Substack article for this matter uh what are your thoughts on it okay um going back to the uh, to the uh, to the topic of cynicism someone who has been trying to tell cynics to give hoping for the good a chance is Dr. Jamil Zaki a psychology professor at Stanford University and the director of its social neuroscience laboratory. Zaki recently published a book called Hope for Cynics, The Surprising Science of Human Goodness. In a nutshell, he says that cynics may observe and rightfully call out the problems and the issues society has been dealing with that most people do not see but do not offer solutions because in their minds... What's the point? What cynics lack, Zaki argues, is the realization that the world is not as dark and as cold as it is, that there will always be people who are genuinely good and open-minded that promote the good of the other. Now, I rarely want to talk about myself uh uh, here in the Intrepid podcast, and even in the Intrepid show or in the brood banter on YouTube, or in my brood banters on YouTube, but as someone who professes Christianity and witnesses the injustices of day-to-day life firsthand, this is what I personally struggle to hold up to, uh, which, which is faith in God and hope in humanity. And I admit that my own observations tend to lead me towards cynicism. But what keeps me merely skeptical at worst and not becoming fully cynical? It's not a, a question of what, but a question of who. Because the reason is a person. And that person is the man of the shroud. The fact that some scientists attempted to skew their findings about the Shroud of Turin in the late 1970s and the 1980s that concluded 
that it was fake makes me think that those very scientists have gone full cynical and did the controversial syndonological study out of spite for religion. Come to think of it, the world was in the middle of the Cold War and the bar for the trust people have for each other was at least in the sixth of the nine circles of hell. Although, to be fair, it was the digital advancements advancements of the 21st century that lowered that same bar to at least the seventh. Either way, I digress. It could be said that the findings of the radiocarbon dating of the shroud in question has been debunked in recent years, saying that the cloth as it now was, a hybrid as it now was, as it now uh, as it is now rather, was a hybrid of fabrics from both the time of Christ and the medieval period as a repair job after a fire gutted the shrine of the shroud in the northwestern Italian city of Turin and damaged the cloth in question. Scientists have also found out that the image in the shroud, shroud rather, cannot be properly replicated, which complicates the study as it is. But outside the controversial and frankly cynical aspects of syndonology, which is basically the study of the Shroud of Turin, the clearer scientific evidence presents reasons to believe that the man of the Shroud is God crucified. And to conclude this uh, part or this uh, episode of the Intrepid Podcast, I would like to say that this position regarding the Shroud of Turin only solidifies one of the famous statements made by one of the Catholic Church's most brilliant minds, if not the most brilliant. And his name is St. Thomas Aquinas. He said, and I quote, To one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Beware the man of a single book. We must love them both, those whose opinions we share and those whose opinions we reject. For both have labored in the search for truth and both have helped us in finding it. Indeed, the command or the mandatum of loving one another is exactly what the man of the shroud is telling all of us. For Christians, this love for the other dispels the darkness and despair of cynicism. This love, this charity, is where faith and hope leads to. Because at the end of the day, faith, hope, and charity remains. And the greatest of them all is charity. And on that note, I end today's podcast. I would like to thank you all for listening so far. It's been half an hour, but we'll see We'll see with that. But anyway, the recording of this episode would be available on YouTube, Spotify, and Substack with further plans to expand to other pl- platforms, so please make sure to check out for that. All of the materials I have ref- referenced for this episode would be listed in the recording's description, and in the Spotify and Substack show notes. If you think there are things I might not have included in this recording, or if you want anyone, if you want to have, if you want to have your say about the matter, uh, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments below if applicable. And also before you go, please make sure to like this video and share this around. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to my channel Intrepid Ian Renyon and ring the not- notification bell by selecting all so you you wouldn't miss out with whatever future content I may create. Please follow me along as well on Spotify and Substack for more podcast episodes and for Substack uh, for more uh, articles from yours truly. And the the name of my Substack is The Intrepid Files. Anyway, before I go and uh, do my closing spiel, I would just like to announce that I will be featuring, I, I will be featured or I would be part of another podcast, uh, which is which I would be co would be co-hosting with two former work colleagues, uh, and it's a much 
it's a much more casual podcast, a much more casual uh setting. It's not as scripted as it is. It's not as uh informative as this podcast is, but it's basically me trying to lay ba- to be uh, lay back or go laid back and not um be uppity or uh serious and all that. I want to be I want to have fun with these two guys and I'll try to uh be as casual as possible in that podcast. Uh maybe by the by the point of this recording it um uh or this podcast episode being released on Spotify, YouTube and Substack, it's already up, but uh I would also provide some announcements regarding it nevertheless after the fact. So do make sure to check it out and uh I hope to see you there as well. As for this podcast, for the Intrepid podcast, it's in the back seat but not the back burner. I would still be creating episodes. It's going to be a bit hard or it's going to be not as frequent as it is at this point, but If it's very important to think about or to talk about, I would definitely do so. And maybe I'll also plug the Intrepid podcast on the other podcast so that there would be a cross uh cross deal or whatever or um cross pollination of uh of subscribers and listeners to uh to both uh to both podcasts. Again, uh I am very much uh privileged to be uh part of that podcast and I would I'm looking forward to uh doing the show with them. So please do check it out once it's uh once it has been released. Anyway, with all that said, this is Intrepid and Reñon reminding you to at all times, now more than ever, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Until then, look alive, stay alive, be kind to yourself and to each other and and you know just be kind. Just be, uh, you know, just be good at pe- good to people. You don't have to be religious to do that, but don't as much as possible. Don't be cynical. That's that's just me, okay. And as always, thank you very much for tuning in. From here in Intrepid HQ, see you next time for another talk here on the Intrepid Podcast, and see you as well in the other podcast that I'll be in. All right. See you there, and see you next time here on the Untapped Podcast. Ian out. <laughs>